talk in more detail about classes and objects and what makes objects different than primitives. All right. Um, we have a sense of that already, right? A, a, a primitive is just a value. All right. Whereas an object is an entity. An object is an instance of a class. A class is an entity within a program domain, a problem domain rather, that can have um, attributes and it can have methods. All right. I think the textbook says it can know things about itself and do things. All right. So we're going to build an example of a class just for one thing, just to review these concepts and to do another example from beginning to end and write some test cases for it. And then we're going to explore um, a little bit about um, memory management and um, how internally classes and, oh, I'm sorry, objects and primitives are stored because they're, they're very different. And if you don't understand that, then things are going to be mysterious to you. And it's going to be like puzzling why one thing works one way, another thing works another way. Whereas if you do understand it, then, then you'll get through that. All right, so we're going we're gonna to do this with something near and dear to my heart. We're going to uh, create a class for pizzas. All right, let's say, let's say we had a pizza shop. All right, and uh, we were, we were going to do this. We're going to create a class for pizza. Now again, we're not going to do an order because an order would typically take up multiple pizzas. Maybe this is something that we'll expand later on where you could have an array of pizzas. In other words, person orders a small cheese and a large pepperoni. All right. Right now we're focusing on simply one pizza. And we'll get the unit test for that working. And then if we expand it later on, we expand it later on. Yes. Yes. Okay. So. Obviously, we could talk about a lot of different kinds of pizzas, and I just want enough stuff in there to make the example interesting. Okay, so um, we could get fancy and talk about stuffed crusts and millions of different toppings and specialty pizzas and all that, but we're going to keep it simple. We're going to be interested in four things about a pizza. I think it's four things. We're going to be interested in the size of the pizza. Small, medium, or large. All right. We're going to be interested in only one topping. We could, we could easily imagine that, you know, we could throw in double pepperoni or pepperoni and sausage and all that. But we're only going to be interested in, in a single topping. This is a... This is, you know, this is like the, you know, a uh, uh, very strict pizza chef who only makes pizzas a certain way. You can either get cheese or pepperoni. It's your only two choices. All right. So we're going to be interested in whether the pizza has pepperoni or not. So either you order cheese pizza or you order a cheese pizza with pepperoni on top. Only two choices. Small, medium, and large. We are going to be interested in how much the pizza costs. All right. And finally, we're going to be interested in how long it takes to bake the pizza. All right. So this is what we're going to put on our template for pizza. Now, a different Different pizzas could look different, right? You could have a small cheese. You could have a medium with pepperoni. You could have a large with pepperoni, a large cheese, and so on. You have all those different combinations of size and pepperoni and so on. All right? Um, so any individual pizza would be an object then. The pizza that I just ordered is an object, as opposed to the pizza class where we consider the template. This is, this is what every pizza knows about itself and can do. 
Of these, which would you think would be attributes and which would you think would be methods? All right, size is an attribute. Hold that thought. All right, size would be an attribute. Pepperell needs a method. Pepperoni is an attribute. Anyone care to contribute to this discussion? Um, I think it miss, uh, makes sense, but I think I missed the very first part of what you said. Yes. Okay, maybe not exactly, but I think you're on the right track. In other words, the way I would score this is you think of an attribute, you think of a characteristic. All right. You think of a method, you think of some process. All right. So, characteristic of the pizza is the size. This is going to be an attribute. Whether it has pepperoni or not, that's an attribute. It's a yes or no in this case, right, if we're not allowing for extra pepperoni. Now, to your point, to, to one of your points, the cost depends on the size and whether there's pepperoni or not. You know, there's going to be a certain base amount, you know, maybe a small pizza is six dollars, a medium is eight, and a large is ten. And then maybe it's an extra dollar if you have pepperoni on it. Uh, on a small, an extra two dollars if you have a pepperoni on a medium, and an extra three dollars if you have a pepperoni on a large. All right. So that's a calculation. Now to be sure, that calculation is going to be based on some of the attributes that we set. So we're not just going to pluck the cost out of a random number generator. And we're not going to have our application assign a cost directly to it and say, this is a $50 pizza, this is a $10 pizza, whatever. The cost is determined by some sort of calculation. So that makes that a candidate to be a method. It's a calculation that depends on the other attributes. All right? You know, calculate tuition. All right? That's a method that depends on other attributes. In other words, are you an in-county student, an out-of-county, or an out-of-state student? How many credit hours are you taking? Those things go into the calculation of your tuition. So it's not simply an attribute that's going to be assigned it's going to be something that's calculated. Now one thing that one term is used in object-oriented programming is the term of encapsulation. In a nutshell, that means that everything about a pizza is going to be contained in this class. So the cost isn't contained somewhere else. All right? And we're not going to simply set the cost from somewhere else. The, the pizza itself is going to have the, the necessary ability to calculate its own cost. And likewise, baking time. And again, I've never worked in a pizza shop, so forgive me if these are wrong, but we're going to assume that it, uh, it takes shorter to bake a small pizza than a large pizza. That kind of makes sense, right? If it doesn't, just let's pretend that it does. All right? So, these are going to be methods. And we'll say that the cost is six for a small, eight for a medium, ten for a large, and then with pepperonis an extra dollar, two dollars, three dollars. I put LL. And baking will assume eight minutes for a small, ten minutes for a medium, and 12 minutes for a large. All right. So those are going to be our assumptions. 
all right, in calculating this. So we want to build this so that this can be used anywhere that we need to use a pizza. This has everything that our restaurant is interested about for pizza. All right. Now, there might be other things, but this will be the assumption that we'll use going forward, that this is what is relevant for our pizza shop. All right. It's always about relevant to the problem domain and the problem that you're about to, to solve. All right. Um, and in our case, we'll say these are the only relevant factors for pizzas. All right. Again, it's encapsulation. There's not going to be somewhere else that, for example, for example tells you how many ca uh, calories are in this pizza. All right. If there was that sort of thing, it would be put into as a method in the, in the pizza class, because that's a calculation a pizza should be able to perform. Likewise, if our policy is to cut a small pizza in six slices and a big pizza into 12 slices and a medium pizza into eight slices, well, then that would be also in the pizza class. So everything relating to a pizza is going to be in a pizza class. We're not going to have pieces of code elsewhere. This is really the big innovation of object-oriented programming before, uh, as opposed to the older procedural style of programming. With procedural style of programming, you had code spread out through a bunch of different programs. So if we were talking about code about employees' payroll, for example, there might be a code in one place that did the paycheck calculation. All right. There might be code in another place that um, printed out the W-2s. There might be code in another place that uh, calculated vacation time or, or something like that. Now the problem was is all this code was strewn out around in a bunch of different procedures. So if something changed, all right, You'd have to go and track down all this code and make sure that it was changed across the line. Stuff wasn't encapsulated. The, the code was spread out throughout. It was focused on a procedure, not focused on an entity and all the attributes and methods. Whereas now we would have something like an employee class, that we had all, everything relevant to an employee would be in that class. And we can then, don't have to look for several places to, 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 to do a test if the employee has any dependents, for example. All right. There'd be one place where we did that check and didn't matter how many processes wanted to know that, they would all go to the same place to look that up. So, in a nutshell, this is what we're going to put into our pizza class. Now, heard a statement when I first said about this, these are all methods. There's an element of truth to that because we are still going to, we're going to create me a methods for these two attributes. We're going to create get and set methods for these. Why? Because we don't want the attributes to be made public. We don't want the attributes to be directly manipulated by outside code. Because if we did that, we run the risk of it breaking. Now again, some of these things sort of just file away in your head for future consideration, but a good example of that would be if we could set the size directly. All right? Our code is going to be expecting certain sizes, S, M, and L, small, medium, and large. If you could manipulate the attributes directly, some code could set the size of a pizza to big. All right? or jumbo, or whatever, right? And if you did that, who knows how the rest of the program would behave? You don't know. All bets are off, all right? What we can do, and we're not going to do it today, but we'll do it eventually, is we can write validation in our set method that says, hey, you going and you're setting the value of the size of the pizza, if it isn't one of these approved values, then it's not valid, all right? And therefore, throw an exception, and you can write code to handle that exception, and so on and so forth. 
So we can control how these attributes are manipulated by putting them in methods. So if we made the, the attributes public, then anyone could do anything to those, method, to, to those uh, attributes. And who knows what the results would be, but they wouldn't be good, right? However, by giving co us control of those attributes, making those attributes private, we're forcing people to go through our methods to manipulate those. So if you want to create a pizza, you can create that pizza, you can set the size to small, medium, and large, but you're going to use a method to do that. And our method can contain the validation and can raise a flag if there's a problem with the value that was set or, or whatever. All right? Questions about that? So let's go and let's create the attributes and methods here for pizza. Public class pizza. I'm going to say private string size. Private Boolean. Is it Boolean or is it just bool? It's the full word? Okay. Let's look up Java primitives. All right, they have a list of them. And sure enough, it is, it is Boolean. There's only a handful of them, though, right? There's a byte, short, almost never going to use those. Int is often used, long is often used, float, double, Boolean, and char or car for a single character. Interestingly enough, notice that string isn't on that list. So string is actually an object. All, right? all these things are simply values. That's all they are. They have no methods associated with them. And by convention, the primitive data types start with a lowercase letter. So if we look here, private boolean I'm going to change that to B. B pepperoni. Now we could initialize it to a default value, right? There's a couple places we could do it. So I could assume that it's not pepperoni unless you set uh, it to true. All right. So well, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to set the attribute to false. All right. So those are our attributes. But again, we don't want the world, the outside world. And again, I'm not talking about users. I'm talking about other programmers. All right. We're building a component that's going to be used in an application. Now, we are ourselves going to be using this because presumably we're part of the team that's writing code for this pizza shop. But there may be other developers that use it as well. And we want to make our components as rock solid as possible. All right. So I'm going to include a public method, public void, set size. That's going to accept a string argument. And it will t simply take the string argument and set the size attribute to it. All right. Going through these first examples, it, sub, students sometimes think like that's a lot of work for like not much of a benefit. But there really is a lot of benefit to this because later on, we're not going to simply have a one-liner to set the uh, size to the attribute. We're going to have some validation in there. We're going to have some control that's going to look to make sure that we only set this to the appropriate value. We're then going to have a get. That 
that simply returns the value of the size. All right. We have the same thing for pepperoni. All right. So any accessing of these properties got to go through the methods. Cannot directly, the outside world cannot directly manipulate them. All right. Then we're going to have our two other methods. The cost. baking time. Now here's an interesting thing. Just looking at the methods, we really almost can't tell what's an attribute, what's a method, right? What attributes belong to methods and what, at, uh, I'm sorry, what methods belong to attributes and what methods are truly methods that do a calculation. That's called data hiding, all right? The idea is, is the outside world, and by the outside world I mean other developers, shouldn't know about the internals of a class shouldn't really know what is saved in a class. Now, we haven't talked about saving a class yet or an object yet, but shouldn't know what is being stored as an attribute. For example, one, one example that I often do in this class relates to if we're doing handling rectangular plots of land, all right, to have length and a width, all right? Now, for a rectangular plot of land, there's a length and there's a width, right? There's also a perimeter with the, dis with the distance all the way around. There's also an area, which would be the width times the length. Now, there would be methods to get all of those, to get the length, to get the width, to get the perimeter, to get the area. What is an attribute? It doesn't matter. We could store, for example, the length and the perimeter and calculate the other two things. We could calculate the width and we could calculate the area. You only need to know two of those things to calculate the other two. If I know the length and width, I can calculate the area and the perimeter. If I know the area and the perimeter, I can calculate, I have a system of equations with two variables, two equations, I could calculate the width and length, and so on. So internally, I could be storing any of those combinations of things shouldn't matter to the outside world. Should be able to use my cl class independently of what is being stored. And the way you do that is through data hiding. All right? And that way, if later on I choose to, to store the data in a different way, shouldn't matter to any programs that use my class because we're not letting them have access to the attributes. So how we're storing things internally shouldn't matter. Okay, so let's go and let's put the calculations in here. I think we said, 
we have a series of if statements. All right. And I'm going to say if size equals small, then I think I said the cost is $6. And, oh yeah, by the way, if B pepperoni then we add one to the cost. All right. Then I said if it's medium, if it's large, then they get two dollars for pepperoni on a medium, and a large costs ten dollars with three dollars for pepperoni. And then when we are done, we return cost. Yes. I initial I'm initializing the cost to zero up there. You are right. The compiler would com No, that's okay. The compiler would complain if, if cost was never initialized because then um, it could foresee a case where none of these if statements were true and it didn't get assign, assigned a cost. So yes, you are correct. You do have to initialize that. Now keep in mind, there's about a million different ways that you could do this. You could do it with else's. You could do it with a case statement. You could do it whatever. Um, I'm keeping it, trying to keep it straightforward. Again, the, the processing time involved is going to be a minor difference between the different variations to do it. So I'm not terribly worried about that. I'm worried about the clarity of the code. All right. So the bake time is similar. And I'm going to say if size equals small, time equals eight minutes. Now, if our pizza place expanded and we started offering, you know, thin crust versus thick crust, that might be a factor in a couple different things, right? That might be a factor in the cost. It might be a factor in the baking time. But the idea here is, is that would be handled via a method, all right? So I could go and I could create a method and I could have an attribute for type of crust. All right. And then I could go in and add to that method extra if statements or extra code or whatever that did the calculation to determine, okay, what if it's a thin crust? What if it's a thick crust? Pardon me? You have two medium pieces. Very good. And then we, at the, at the end here, we're going to return the time. Now, I'm going to go and compile this. That doesn't really do me a lot of good, right? Because I don't have any code to test this. Right? I can't run any app because I don't have 
the unit test module with a main method in it. But I'm going to go compile it anyhow just to make sure that, you know, I didn't typo on anything or anything along those lines. <coughs> so I'll go here. CD desktop. CD pizza. Just kidding. DIR. There's my, I already have the shell of a unit test class, even though there's nothing in it. And I have my pizza class. So I can type in Java C pizza.java. Let's make sure I saved it first. And it compiled cleanly. So it worked. We can go home. No, just kidding. We have to test this. Okay. So how are we going to test this? Well, first of all, let's just make a basic test to test one pizza. How many test cases should we have in total? At least. Yeah. It would seem to me the test is completely. I would test all three sizes, small, medium, and large without pepperoni, small, medium, and large with pepperoni. And make sure that the cost came out right and the cooking time came out right. Right? So that's what that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna eventually, we might not do it right off, but eventually we're gonna test all six scenarios. We're gonna create six pizzas. Again, Got to create six pizza objects. An object is an instance of that class. So we have a template for what the rules are for pizzas, the calculations, the attributes. We're going to make six of them, and then we're going to test to make sure that it works correctly for all these. Okay, let's start off small, though, and let's do one pizza. All right. So, I'm going to create a pizza and I'm going to call it P. Thanks. I'm going to create a pizza and I'm going to call it P. P is going to equal a new pizza. Alright? Now remember that in the past, in, in previous classes, if I'm not mistaken, we did these two steps in shorthand. And we combined them into one. But I did want to type out both instructions before I combine them to show you that really there's two things going on here. Number one is I'm creating a variable named P that is going to hold what is called an object reference. Now this is going to become more important when we start talking about the difference between a primitive and an object. But when we say, when we have a class in front of it and not a primitive, it's creating what is called an object reference or a pointer to an object. And by saying pizza P, we're saying that I have this Location and memory, a variable, because that's what variables are, right? They're location and memory. That is going to hold a piece of data. What piece of data is it going to hold? It's going to hold a pointer or a reference to a pizza object. So we can't put something else in here. If we say it's going to have a pizza in that variable, we couldn't put a sub sandwich in it, right? If we had a sub sandwich class. Because, hey, we said that that variable P is just meant to be holding a reference to a pizza. So we couldn't put a sandwich or a beverage or anything else in there. All right? The second step, so this sets up the pointer. This allocates the memory 
and gives a little location in memory that's going to hold a pointer to an object and it gives it the name P. So that's all a variable is, is a name associated with a place in memory. So this allocates the memory for the pointer. Alright. This actually allocates the memory for the object itself and then points the pointer to the object. Alright. Objects live in a location in memory called the heap. Alright. I didn't make these names up. That's just what they're called. So really, if I was going to write this as two statements, it's called the stack, by the way. The first statement Pizza P creates this little location in memory where I'm going to store a pointer eventually to a pizza object. But I haven't made any pizzas yet. All right? It's a pointer, but it's a pointer that doesn't point to anything. A very common error that developers get is what's called a null pointer exception. And that's exactly the scenario we have here, where we have an object reference that doesn't point to anything yet. That's what this statement does. Is it creates an object reference. The name of this guy is P. We're going to put a pizza in here eventually. Or rather, we're going to put a pointer to a pizza here, all right, eventually. And that eventually is, is when we say P equals new pizza. That does two things. That allocates the memory for a pizza object, which has, of course, its own attributes. Size and pepperoni and has its methods. So we've created this on the heap. And when we say P equals new pizza, then we stuff in whatever that memory location is, some sort of number. I don't know. We'll say it's a hundred in this case. Okay. That's actually what's happening when we execute those two statements. And that's important to know. All right? The meaning of those the two halves of that the uh, two parts of that statement. One sets up memory for a pointer. Doesn't do anything with that memory yet, just sets it aside. That is the P or pizza P. That sets up a pointer called P, in which we're going to point, create a pointer to a pizza object. The second part, P equals new pizza, actually creates the pizza object, the instance of that, all right, pizza class, and puts it on the heap. These attributes are sometimes called instance variables. Why? Because each instance of that class has its own values, right? Each pizza has its own value for size and pepperoni and so on, all right? So those depend on the specific instance of that pizza class. So that's what these two statements do. Again, if we want to, we can combine them into one shot like this. Then it does both those things together. It creates the location for the pointer. It creates the pizza object in on the heap. And it makes sure that pointer points to that pizza object. 
So anything that we do with regards to that variable P is pointing to that pizza object that's laying in the heap. Alright? So I could say P set size medium. Make a medium pizza. P dot set pepperoni false. Now that I've done that, I can say That's my 216 class. I have rabbits now, so my examples are rabbit based. 2. Well, one is a little bunny, one is a giant bunny. Like a fair rabbit? No, it's good. It's it's better than fair. It's good. It's a good rabbit. <laughs> They are indoor bunnies. All right, so that's, that's not the end of our test cases, but this is certainly a starting point for our test cases, right? We, can, we create a medium without pepperoni, and it should cost what? Eight dollars, I think. Yes. And then let's see how long it should bake. All right. So let's go and save this. Um, in the interest of time, no. But we can, we can go and we can add those later. All right. Uh, I kind of am testing the, the sets anyhow, because if the calculation works, that means the set worked. But yeah, you're right. I haven't tested the get, and I probably should. All right. Let's go and last compile unit test. It'll compile pizza if it needs to. Uh, it doesn't always compile it. Like, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't changed pizza. I, I've compiled it since the last time I changed it. So I probably, it probably will not compile it. But if it needed to, it would. All right. If I had never compiled pizza, or if I made changes to pizza and I hadn't compiled it. So let's go and compile it. Unit test. All right. Cannot find symbol. Get bake time. All right. Get baking time. Again, the 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 error message is Sometimes useful, sometimes less useful. In this case, it says method get bake time on variable TP of type pizza. What that essentially is telling me is it can't find bake time in the class pizza. All right, so it was a pretty good descriptive error message once you know what it means. All right, so I'll go and I'll change that in the 
unit test class and recompile it. And it compi compiled. We do a list here. Notice that the pizza class was compiled at 133, which represents the last time I changed it. The unit class, unit test class, which I just compiled is at 147. So it, it was the compiler is smart enough to know I didn't it didn't have to recompile the pizza class. Alright. So now I'm gonna go and run it. CLS to clear screen. And I'll say Java unit test. And it tells me that the pizza costs eight dollars and it should bake for ten minutes. And if I'm not mistaken, that's correct. Okay? So, we could certainly expand our unit test. And this is where sort of knowing the factors that go into this is important because the cost depends on those two things. One of the things can take two values, one of the things can take three values, therefore will take six test cases. All right? We could test the gets Compile this. Medium, no pepperoni. Okay, so we did verify that. So, again, to test this thoroughly, what we would do is we would build the other five test cases. I'd create a medium with pepperoni, make sure that the results were correct. Medium or uh, um, a large with, a large without, a small with, a small without. Okay. So that's what we could do to t comprehensively test this, to comprehensively unit test this pizza class. Once we got that built, and we were confident it built, it, it built correctly, we could go on maybe and make an order class where we allowed multiple pizzas to be created and put on an order. And then what would the cost of the order be? Well, the cost of the order would be the sum of the cost of all the pizzas. What would the baking time be? Probably whatever the longest one takes to bake, right? Assuming that your oven was big enough, right? Uh, that you didn't have that. So if you had, you know, so if you were quoting to a customer when they could pick up their pizza, if they had an 8-minute pizza and a 12-minute pizza, well, you'd use the higher number, assuming you could cook them at the same time. All right. This is a good review of the concepts of objects and classes, attributes and methods. What we will focus on next time, again, is to cover, now that we've seen a little diagram that describes how an object is created on the heap and the pointer works and all that. Next time we're going to consider some implications of that. Because that's not necessarily obvious. And it is different than how primitives work. Primitives work one way, object references work a different way. So we'll explore that um, in class next time. All right, we'll see you up in lab.